All right. Well, welcome everybody to the latest edition of the GBO Science Lunch Talks. Today we will have uh, our wonderful local postdoc, Pedro Salas, um, and he'll be talking to us about a molecule near and dear to my own heart, hydrogen cyanide and its use um, through carbon radio recombination lines in Orion Molecular Cloud A. So take it away. Thanks, yes. Yep, so hello everyone. I'm Pedro Salas, a postdoctoral fellow at the Green Bank Observatory, uh, where I mainly work on the LASI project, but today I wanted to talk about something else. And that's this uh, very small project uh, that I've been doing with this peop uh, this a wonderful group of people down here. And unfortunately in this case, not the GBT, but rather it's European counterpart, the Effelsberg 100 meter telescope. Um, so yeah, just wanna talk a bit about how hydrogen cyanide and carbon radio recombination lines are related uh, towards the Orion molecular cloud. Uh, part of which we see here in this uh, beautiful infrared uh, image in the background. So just as a bit of a motivation, um, why I care so much about uh, HCN? Well, basically because if we think about star formation, which is one of the things we, we astronomers would really like to understand uh, how it takes place, uh, how it changes across cosmic time and a uh, myriad of other things related to it. Well, some of the things we know is that it takes place in the densest portions of molecular clouds. Um, so the way we usually observe these molecular clouds is uh, using the first rotational transition of CO in the millimeter. But this transition usually traces uh, uh, a white uh, gas that is more diffuse than what is considered to be the exact uh, than the density uh, at which we think star formation is taking place. So people look for uh, other tracers of molecular gas, which might be uh, probing more directly these dense regions. One of them is uh, hydrogen cyanide. Um, and basically it's, uh, well, why, why we say it's, it's uh, tracing denser gas? Well, it has a higher critical density, so uh, it should be, uh, it should be excited at a higher density than CO. And when we look, uh, for example, at other galaxies, like this plot over here on the right, we see that there's a tight linear correlation between the uh, total infrared luminosity, which is a proxy for the recent star formation rate, and the luminosity of the HCN 1 to 0 line, which tells us that uh, this might be uh, more closely related to the, this dense cast and other uh, tracers such as CO. Um, and this is uh, particularly interesting uh, looking at these correlations between, uh, between for, uh, in this case, using the, the HCN line as a proxy for the mass of dense gas and the infrared luminosity as, as a proxy for the star formation rate. Because, uh, well, depending on how this, uh, how the luminosity of HCN converts into a, into a gas mass. For example, if this is just a constant conversion factor, since we have a linear relation then between uh, luminosity and mass and star formation rate, this will imply uh, a constant star formation efficiency, which in turn uh, would mean that uh, star formation is, uh, could mean, for example, that star formation is taking place uh, once you reach a certain critical density. If you are above this critical density, then uh, gas will start to, to collapse and form stars. Uh, however, if this uh, alpha HCN factor changes, this is the basically a factor that takes you from luminosity to mass, um, then this uh, linear relation uh, no longer implies a, a constant star formation efficiency, uh, but rather that uh, there are variations, uh, particularly uh, due to the, the kind of galaxy you're looking at, the environment in which the clouds are, uh, things like pressure, metallicity uh, will affect uh, how this alpha HCN changes. And that is one of the things we would like to understand to uh, sort of 
be able to interpret uh, these beautiful relations uh, in a more uh, uh, with a physical motivation. So we can also understand how the star formation efficiency is changing and the star formation history of the, the universe. Um, so that this is what uh, Jens Kaufman and collaborators have been working on. Um, in particular, they did this study towards the Orion A uh, molecular cloud, which is shown here in dust emission. And you can see kind of uh, the northern part of the integral shaped filament. We're missing here the, the southern tail that really makes this thing look like an integral. And they uh, went out to answer the question, well, what is the, the conversion factor between the, the HCN luminosity and the mass of the of, of the of the dense gas or the total gas mass, uh, and they they did this by comparing the the HCN luminosity against the dust derived mass for the Orion molecular cloud, and surprisingly they, they found a value that's pretty close to what uh, Gao and Solomon uh, derived from their from a simple model of a spherical cloud, uh, but uh, something else. Uh, popped up out of their out of their study and that's uh, this well first of all the not so surprising factor that uh, despite having a critical density which is uh, 10 times to a six uh, particles per cubic centimeter if we look at the distribution of the gas it is much more extended than for example nh2 plus uh, which has a lower critical density so this is not surprising uh, people knew that the critical density is just a, a sort of a, it's just telling us when radiative uh, uh, processes uh, balance uh, collisional excitation. Um, but uh, this was a, a very clear example of uh, that, that this critical density is, just, is not related really to the density of, the, of uh, being traced by the gas. Um, and one of the other things that they found from looking at this data and modeling the, the ISF as a cylinder was that uh, roughly 50% of the of the emission from HCN comes from regions which have a density lower than a thousand particles per cubic centimeter, which is uh, quite low for for HCN. Uh, usually, one would assume a factor of 10 higher density for uh, for the gas traced by this gas. This has also been observed in other molecular clouds like uh, Orion B by Jerome Petit uh, using the uh, the IRAM telescope. And also by uh, Barnes et al. Uh, he actually gave a talk about his work uh, here at the Launch Talks uh, a couple of weeks ago, where he also finds a similar uh, uh, sort of lack of uh, correspondence between the spatial extent of the HCN emission and the critical density. Uh, and again, uh, modeling the region, this is W49, modeling this region, I think they, they use a sphere in this case, uh, they also find that roughly half of the the emission comes from a density slower than a, a thousand particles per cubic centimeter, which is quite interesting and uh, leads to 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 uh, uh, let me to try to to understand a bit better like why do we see all this emission at, at low uh, at such low densities, um, and what's basically what's driving the, the excitation of the line at these low densities where we would normally not expect to see so much emission, and uh, one of the things they, they proposed, uh, particularly, uh, uh, well, it wasn't uh, something new, it's been around since the 70s, I believe, is the, the fact that uh, HCN will get uh, uh, collisionally excited if uh, it uh, collides with electrons, and that this process can be quite efficient if you're uh, in a regime where the ionization fraction, that is the, the number of electrons per, per protons, uh, is higher than roughly 10 to the minus five. So uh, that gave me an idea of, well, uh, let's look at the at the, the Orion molecular cloud. Let's look at a tracer of, uh, of gas at a, a low ionization fraction. I mean, at a high ionization fraction, such as the carbon radio recombination lines and compare the two and see uh, what comes out. So that's what we did uh, here. It's a better image of the integral shape filament you can see it clearly here and uh, have the orion bar here and we're not gonna focus on this region because there's a lot of things going on but 
we're rather going to focus on the northern part of the integral shape filament, uh, where there's a, a lot of embedded star formation taking place. And well, not a lot, but there is some star formation taking place there. And uh, the, there are no, uh, no massive uh, host stars uh, so close as in the bar or in NGC 1977. Um, so this shows a bit better the, the, the positions we studied in carbon radio recombination lines. So we have the infrared uh, continuum, we have the far infrared C plus line uh, emission, which again shows uh, part of the, the northern most part of the integral chip filament, but it traces preferentially uh, as well uh, UV illuminated surfaces of molecular clouds in this region. And we focus on this little square here where we have the Orion molecular clouds two and three. And in particular, we just targeted these five positions with the Effelsberg radio telescope. So what we're showing here, it's the, in the eight micron emission as seen by its Spitzer. Uh, we see, for example, some foreground filaments in absorption uh, against the bright back background. We see these uh, green dots, which are uh, continuum, uh, I forget which frequency, I think it's uh, five, nine gigahertz continuum sources, um, which are tracing uh, like most likely young H2 regions. And uh, we also have uh, this region here where there's a, a group of uh, stars uh, being formed and uh, these other regions all along the the two Orion molecular clouds and towards this particular region, Effelsberg 5, there's also some overlap between the, the Orion molecular cloud and just the edge of the of this uh, H2 region NGC 1977. So there we do expect to to see more of like a PDR kind of uh, uh, a, a, like a, a denser kind of PDR than in this uh, more kind of quiescent regions which are where we don't have any O stars really O or B stars really close by. So we targeted these five regions in carbon radio recombination lines, in particular at five gigahertz. We observed three lines because that's what the uh, what we can do with the Effelsberg backends. The 102 alpha carbon line, 109 alpha carbon line, and 110 alpha carbon lines. And uh, this just means that these are transitions where you have, for example, a carbon atom transitioning from 103 to 102. That's the alpha in the name. So these are the brightest transitions. Um, since these lines, even though they are like different, they are very similar in their properties, we average them to increase the signal to noise ratio of our observations. Um, we could only do this with two of the three lines because the 1010 alpha is, was affected by RFI. Uh, so this gives us roughly a factor square root of two increase in signal to noise. And then, well, we did two things uh, with this uh, data set. We compare them against the far infrared lines of uh, ionized carbon to model the gas in the surface of these molecular clouds and derive physical conditions. And we also compared it with HCN to try to see, okay, like, are they probing the same volumes? Uh, if so, uh, that would mean that HCN is basically a probing gas that has a high ionization fraction. And uh, that could explain uh, why we see so much emission around. Uh, it's important to know that here we focused mainly on the, on the densest portions of the molecular cloud, right? carbon radio recombination lines are quite faint. So we started here, but ideally to, to probe this, uh, we should really go a bit farther, to, either to the left or the right to really prove these regions where the, where the density is expected to be lower. Uh, so in terms of results, this is how the spectra look like from these five regions. Have uh, Effelsberg 1 up here, so it's inverted, it's down here, and Effelsberg 5, 5 up here, down here, and here in particular I'm showing the lines from hydrogen and carbon, the recombination lines. 
So these lines are roughly 150 kilometers per second apart. So in one setup of the of the, of the spectrometer, we get them <clears throat> both. And we can see that we detect uh, both lines uh, in some of the, the regions, uh, like here. And, but, and in some other, we don't detect uh, hydrogen, which is, uh, yeah, there's uh, not, not much to say about that. But it's uh, important to know that the carbon line is m way more narrow than the hydrogen line, and their central velocities are also quite different. So the hydrogen lines appear roughly at zero kilometers per second, while the carbon lines are roughly at uh, 10 kilometers per second. So based on the differences in widths and, uh, and central velocities, we know that these lines are not associated at all. Uh, the hydrogen lines are tracing warm ionized gas, while the carbon lines are probing uh, cold neutron material. And uh, we also know that we didn't detect any helium radio recombination lines, which implies that the, the hardness of the ionizing radiation is uh, it's not uh, enough to, to ionize helium. So um, comparing with the C plus line, we see that we have similar velocity, similar line profiles overall. As, uh, are shown here the C plus line in uh, red, uh, carbon radio combination line in greenish, and the 13 C plus line in bluish. And we see that the three of them roughly trace the same uh, structure. Well, there's a small offset in velocity. Uh, if we look at this uh, sort of this composite C plus spectrum, which has a couple of uh, kinks here and there, uh, there's a, a, sh a difference between the central velocities of the two lines. And uh, that's uh, more clear here and here. Um, so there are two things. Uh, well, first is that the, the velocity between C plus and the carbon radio combination line is not exactly the same, but we'll go back to that uh, in the next slide. And also the C plus line is broader than the carbon radio combination lines. Though the 13 C plus line, which is optically thin, uh, does agree uh, remarkably well with the carbon radio combination line. For example, here it's really hard to tell them apart uh, when you plot them on the same scale. So some of the explanations for why we have this broader uh, C plus lines, it could be optical depth. If the line is optically thick, then you get uh, optical, uh, you get opacity broadening. You could also have multiple velocity components as suggested by the shoulders of the lines. And that's something that we tried to answer uh, by, well, here this shows better the, the lines and how the 13 C plus and carbon ray recombination lines agree remarkably well, but not so much with the, this composite C plus profile. The reason why I call it uh, composite is because uh, since it has all these shoulders, uh, it is likely that it's composed of multiple velocity components. And that's one of the things we investigated, just decomposing it into uh, multiple uh, Gaussian profiles using the Akai K information criterion to select the number of uh, velocity components. Uh, the, this uh, criterion would tell us what's the best uh, model from the set of models tested, but it does not guarantee that this is the actual uh, best model, right? It only discriminates between the ones we try. And what we find is that in for all the C plus line profiles, we require three or more velocity components. Uh, this is an example of how this decomposition looks like towards one of the positions. And uh, it's very clear by looking at this that this is quite degenerate um, in terms of since you don't really resolve some of this uh, very well, some of these velocity components, you can uh, change their amplitudes and widths uh, in various ways and get the same answer. Um, what I draw a bit of, uh, like, I'm, I'm confident that this is not. Uh, as crazy as it as it might sound, uh, fitting three or more velocity components to something that looks maybe like a single Gaussian, mainly because if we look at optically thin tracers at higher spatial resolution, uh, in particular the NH N2 H plus line, uh, we do see that there are more than one velocity component. So we have the just look at this line here close to 11 kilometers per second, which is the these other two wings are just the fine structure components, but we see there are two clear peaks and a 
small kink here to the left. So the composition is not uh, completely crazy or uh, unphysical. Uh, once we decompose the, the C plus line into multiple velocity components, we can compare that with what the carbon radio recombination lines are doing. And that's shown here on the right, where we have first the uh, central velocity of the velocity of the different line profiles and their uh, separation in terms of their uh, of their of their standard deviation. Um, so anything below three here is uh, means that they are statistically consistent, assuming that they have a Gaussian errors, uh, that we have Gaussian errors in the line centroid. And down here we show the line width uh, for the for all the velocity components in C plus and the recombination lines. And we take the ratio between the, the component that is closest in velocity with respect to the radio recombination line. In this case, we see that uh, there's a factor of four larger, and in this case, there's a factor of two broader, the C plus line. Uh, so even though there are multiple velocity components, the C plus line is still broader. So this could, uh, this, uh, tells us that there's something else. It's not just the fact that the C plus is tracing uh, many things along the line of sight, but also that, uh, it's likely to be optically thick. Um, this can be uh, seen here, uh, where we show basically the 13 C plus line in bluish, uh, scaled by the uh, 13 C abundance with respect to the 12 C abundance. So if the line was optically thin, when we scale the 13C plus uh, uh, intensity by the abundance, we should see similar peaks, but we see that the 13C plus is uh, way brighter when we scale it. And that tells us that there is a, very likely that the, the C plus line is optically thick. And in this particular case, Effelsberg 4, we also see that we can uh, decompose the C plus profile into a self-absorbed profile. That means we have a background emission and uh, a colder component in front, and the colder component is basically absorbing the emission from the back. So we have, in this case, this uh, dash line showing the background and the dot dash line showing the foreground, and that gives us this orange line, so it reproduces very well the, the absorbed profile if we consider self-absorption. And then uh, yeah, we we'll, we use we will use all this information uh, later to derive gas properties by comparing the the C plus thirteen C plus and the carbon radio recombination lines. Um, in terms of how does the carbon radio code the carbon radio combination lines compare with uh, HCN? Well, the the correspondence is quite well, quite good. Sorry, and uh, in we have HCN in purplish, and what we see here at roughly fifteen. Kilometers per second is one of the hyperfine structure components. This one close to 11 is the brightest one. And that's the one we uh, are comparing uh, against here in the, uh, with the carbon radio combination lines. And again, we see uh, they have similar peaks. The widths are also uh, similar. And uh, yeah, uh, of course the signal to noise of the recombination line spectra is not great, but uh, uh, they do look similar enough that uh, there's no evidence of them being uh, uh, markedly different, that of them proving markedly different uh, uh, gas structures. So from this comparison of the profiles, we first of all, well, we, we can say uh, confidently, okay, the carbon radio combination lines are actually also probing the, the at least the envelope of the uh, Orion molecular clouds. And uh, then we can, uh, try to use this information to model things a bit more. Um, another interesting thing that comes out from this comparison is that the, the intensities of the lines are anti-correlated. As we see here, uh, we have the carbon rate recombination line intensity and the HCN intensity. And we see that uh, from Effelsberg 5 down to Effelsberg F1, uh, the intensity decreases uh, as the HCN intensity inc increases. And we think this is likely because the HCN column is increasing as the, so if you have a fixed uh, amount of column, uh, you can have ionized carbon in, sorry, the, the more exposed portion and HCN in the more shielded portion. And as you uh, sort of vary the, the properties of the 
of the of the gas and the inside the radiation field, you will get more uh, carbon layer or uh, and less HCN layer, or more HCN layer and less carbon layer. And I think that's what's driving this anti-correlation. Uh, so in terms of the analysis that we did, well, we a sim very simple model where we take the carbon ready recombination lines and the far infrared uh, lines from ionized carbon and compare them to a prediction of a model which is homogeneous. So we take the whole part of a PDR of a photo association region where carbon is ionized. Uh, the properties of the gas are going to change along this slice in terms of density and temperature, but we assume that it's just a single value and uh, we go from there. And we also assume uh, so this layer should have uh, a ionization fraction of roughly 1.5 times 10 to the minus 4. That is the same as the carbon abundance, uh, mainly because the, uh, that's the, the carbon is the main donor of electrons in this region. So they are roughly the same. And by modeling the, this layer this way and comparing against the observations, we can derive a, a excitation properties for the C plus line, its excitation temperature and its optical depth, the temperature of the gas, the electron density and the C plus column density. And combining some of these things, we can also get a size of the region along the line, line of sight, and thermal velocity dispersion and a non-thermal velocity dispersion. And from here, I just want to point out uh, that, uh, well, first of all, that efforts for this F2 region, where we have uh, a lower signal to noise ratio, in particular for the 13C plus line. Uh, we can't do much in terms of saying something about the gas properties. The ranges are quite uh, large. But once we get all the lines with a signal to noise ratio larger than five, we can actually constrain these things, uh, I would say, uh, quite well. Uh, we get temperatures of roughly 50 Kelvin for the gas and densities of roughly 0.8 electrons per cubic centimeter. If you want to turn this into a gas density, you just divide this value by the uh, ionization fraction, so 1.5 times 10 to the minus 4. And this corresponds roughly to densities of a few thousands, up to almost 10,000 particles per cubic centimeter in total gas density. So, um, the, the properties are remarkably, I mean, are quite similar for both the uh, regions. Uh, we also see that the optical depth of the C plus line is uh, quite high, which uh, confirms what we were saying about uh, the, uh, this region being optically thick. Um, for the region number four, we also try the, this is trying just a model of pure emission, but if we try a model where we have a self-absorption, uh, this changes quite a bit the optical depth, but the rest of the gas properties remains uh, roughly the same, which is quite surprising, but also quite encouraging because that means that uh, the results are not so model dependent in terms of what's happening with the C plus line. And I'll leave it at that. Um, so once we have the, the these properties, well, uh, first of all, we uh, just look at a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is just that um, it does seem like the fraction of the column density in the C plus layer is indeed increasing as we go from two to four to five as relative to the total column density here. This comes from the dust analysis. And this just from the, the recombination line and C plus analysis. So it does seem like that this idea that the HCN and the C plus layers are like uh, basically competing for the total space uh, seems to, to hold in that sense. And that also hints us that they're not tracing the same gas. And we also looked at the gas temperature because, uh, well, if both, if HCN and the combination lines and C plus were tracing the same volumes, we would expect to see similar temperatures. So we compare the temperatures derived from the analysis of the carbon lines with the temperatures of the molecular gas derived from two methods. One is using the ammonia lines and another method using the ratio between HCN and HNC. Both methods for the molecular gas give consistent results, uh, which is uh, quite nice. And we also see that uh, 
the C plus gas does seem to be tracing warmer gas. So based on all this, I um, yeah, I personally I, I conclude that uh, they're not probing exactly the same uh, volumes of gas, HCN and, and the recombination lines. So that uh, tells us immediately that um, the ionization fraction of the gas of the gas that HCN is proving along the the spine of the ISF of the integral shape filament cannot be as high as 10 to F4. But then, uh, um, and this is also confirmed if we look at higher resolution observations, for example, this is the work of Greg uh, Vidovsky. We also see that HCN and the recombination lines are tracing, have different spatial structures. So that uh, then, uh, uh, so we end up with, okay, like HCN and the recombination lines are not tracing the same gas, but then what is the initiation fraction of the of the molecular gas? Can we actually say something about this? And luckily uh, there was this work by uh, the French group uh, led by Emeric Braun, in which they studied how different tracers uh, could predict the ionization fraction as a function of uh, line intensities or column density ratios. And uh, we use the results here. I'm showing a particular example where they show how the ionization fraction changes as a function of the HCN to CN ratio. Uh, but they also have uh, results for HCN, sorry, uh, C to H or HCN. And uh, they give uh, basically uh, sort of a simple recipe where you input a value of the ratio and you get a kind of, uh, you get uh, an estimation of what the ionization fraction for the gas is. Uh, so a caveat of this analysis is though that we're using this C to H or HCN ratio, and these models do not consider spatial structure. And we do know that C to H and HCN are tracing slightly different volumes. So the results I'm gonna show now are just uh, kind of an average ionization fraction for the molecular gas. It should not be taken as, uh, as exact values for the ionization fraction of HCN. So this is how this, these ratios look like. Uh, we used to uh, focus on these three regions, uh, just as an example. And uh, up here, we show the, the F1 to zero component of the C2H line or the whole HCN uh, intensity. And since this line is not as bright, we also uh, used the one-to-one -one line and scaled it to intensity to, using a simple relation, uh, scaled it to a one-to-zero line to sort of extend this analysis towards the, the regions where the C to H line is uh, fainter. And what we see here is that, um, well, the, the, the ratio between the two lines remains roughly constant uh, as you move away from the spine of the filament. And if we were to take these uh, results at face value, it would imply uh, ionization fractions of roughly uh, a few times 10 to the minus six. It's roughly three times to the minus six, which is below the, the point at which uh, collisions with electrons uh, would be a significant, uh, uh, would dominate the excitation of HCN. Um, there are some hints for uh, for this ratio increasing as you move away, but um, the, uh, the ratio is still consistent with just a constant value. So, I'll end there. Uh, just as a summary, we observed these uh, five gigahertz carbon radio combination lines towards the Orion molecular clouds two and three. We detected the lines towards four, four out of five positions. And by comparing them with uh, other tracers, such as the far infrared lines of C, HCN, and some other molecular uh, gas tracers, uh, we can say confidently okay, these are all tracing the same structure overall. Uh, the details are a bit trickier. Um, well, uh, by comparing the the carbon, the ionized the lines from ionized carbon and the recombination lines, we were able to derive electron densities and sizes for the uh, C plus uh, layer of the gas, and the interface, with a signal uh, whenever we attack the lines with a signal to noise ratio larger than five, and uh, we find that HCN and the carbon that the intensities of HCN and the carbon radio recombination lines are anti-correlated, and it is very likely that they probe different volumes, uh, uh, at least along the spine of the ISF. 
it still remains to be seen if uh, if we were to integrate deeper uh, far away from the spine uh, what would this kind of analysis tell us and at least uh, in these regions uh, we can say that it, uh, collisions with electrons are not a significant source of excitation for the hcn line and i'll leave it there and if there are any questions i would be happy to try to answer them great fantastic talk pedro um, so uh, first off, I noticed that uh, John Tobin has two messages in the chat, uh, which I can read out unless he is still around and would like to ask them to you directly. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Um, I was going to ask if you uh, expected the source of ionization for the carbon recombination lines to be embedded protostars, or if this is O stars down the trapezium that are uh, responsible for the ionization? Um, yeah, I didn't do the, the calculations explicitly. That's, yeah, that, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. I didn't do the calculations explicitly. I know that at least uh, in towards this position, uh, the ionization from the, the OB stars in NGC 1977 would be enough to provide enough uh, ionizing photons to keep carbon ionized down to here. Um, in this, uh, the, I imagine, yeah, I imagine that that holds for the other regions. And here, uh, it's interesting because we have sort of like the um, the, the most uh, active uh, star formation maybe uh, going on in this region, and we don't see the the, the carbon recombination line. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's not only having enough uh, ionizing photons, but also having the the right. Uh, gas conditions to be able to see these lines. But yeah, I, I, I think uh, overall it's mainly the, the ionization from the massive O stars that's uh, driving this, the ionization of carbon. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, my other one was a, was a comment about the, mm -hmm. the N2H plus, if you could go to your slide on that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's oh, oh, here. Ah, yeah, here. So what I wanted to point out is that so the N2H plus has seven hyperfine components. So mm -hmm. the one by three kilometers per second, that one's a single line, an isolated component. But the other two clumps, those are composed of three hyperfines each. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah, so, the, so yeah. You'll, I think the line widths are, must, are just narrow enough that the, that those other those extra peaks and even that shoulder are the the other hyperfines of it. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I guess that that uh, yeah, that really changes the interpretation of the. Uh, the C++ yeah, I don't, I don't I don't know that it completely changes the interpretation mm -hmm. because if you look at the one at three kilometers per second, that one is a single component. It does mm -hmm. look like the well. You'd, you'd have to, I guess you'd have to look into fitting it. It does look like the base of that line is sort of broader mm -hmm. than what a single Gaussian would, would be. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and Hakkar at all does find a multi, lot of multiple components within that, within that region as a whole. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, thanks a lot for pointing that out. I, I completely missed that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Yeah, those hyperfine lines are always a pain, especially <laughs> when you, you can't really resolve them. Mm. Um, so um, if anyone else has a question they'd like to bring up, um, in the meantime, I wanted to ask you a question myself. Um, mm -hmm. In the slide, we were talking about the temperatures, uh, estimating the temperatures through um, various means. Um, mm. I couldn't help but notice mm -hmm. um, there's this slight trend towards um, the third position where it, the temperature seemed to decrease and then increase mm. back up again. Yeah. Um, you said you hadn't really touched much on like the ionization sources within mm -hmm. the molecular gas itself. Um, but do you think that this is due to um, correlation with where the gas is being irradiated from? that you get this sort of dip in the temperature across these positions? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I, I personally, I hadn't uh, thought about that, but yeah, it, it 
could be uh, to have to um, yeah I guess a, a good way of, of also looking at that is looking at the dust temperature and seeing if that tells you or just the, the dust SED until uh, I'm trying to get the the interstellar radiation field uh, from that uh, from that analysis yeah that would be interesting to look at uh, personally I, I yeah I I don't think that my opinion matters too much in this, but. <laughs> um, all right, well, uh, we have a couple of minutes left until one o'clock. So if anyone else has a question they would like to ask of Pedro. Speak now or, well, just email him later. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, since it does not seem like uh, everyone, anyone is actually interested in trying to ask a question, then uh, let's give one final thank you to Pedro's talk and his work here. Um, and then I'll just let you know that uh, next week we'll have a presentation by our own Natalie Butterfield, who will be talking about um, her recent GBT project on the Galactic Bar. So thank you everyone for attending and have a good rest of your week.